Hey, friends. I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Kevin Gordon. He's going to tell you a story about when Keith Richards, Levon Helm, and a bunch of other legends recorded a song that he wrote with Gwil Owen called Deuce and a Quarter. Uh, Gary Talent, who was producing a record on me at the time, had was also making a record on Sonny that was released on Rounder. And he picked a song that Gwil and I had written, Fast Train, for Sonny's record. So the guy who was managing Sonny at the time, Dan Griffin, called me and asked me if I had any more songs because he was doing this project with Keith or with, with Scotty Moore and DJ Fontana. He was managing those guys as a, as a duo, as, a, as all the King's men. And Dan, you know, he was, he was a great guy, but, you know, like some folks in the management realm, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, everything's a Maxfield Parish horizon, you know, it's just glorious and beautiful and, and you know, uh, overstated perhaps, you know, Keith Richards, yeah, okay, you know, and I thought, you know, okay, what the hell, I'll, you know. So I, I sat down with an acoustic guitar. The, with the delay, delay pedal I still have on my pedal board today that I've used for 30 years. Beat up, beat up SM58 through that pedal into a cassette deck, playing and singing into one microphone. I did Deuce and a Quarter and three other songs that Gwil and I had written together. Deuce and a Quarter being the only one that remotely would have worked. Uh, sent it off on a cassette. This was That's how long ago it was, kids. Um, and I thought nothing of it. Maybe a month later, I, I get a phone call from Dan. Hey, I'm in, uh, I'm in Manhattan. And guess what I've been doing today? Riding around in a limo listening to Deuce and a Quarter with, with, with Keith Richards. <laughs> you know, it's one of these, really, okay, cool, cool, man, you know, uh, great, uh, thank you, thank you, you know, uh, and he told me that the session was, you know, they had scheduled the session, they were going to do it at Levon's house, you know, in upstate New York, and it was supposed to happen over a certain time, it was either late June or very early July of, of that year. It was about six weeks out from when we were talking. I, he sort of gave me a rundown of who was going to be involved. And I'm like, wow, you know, if all those people show up and are actually conscious and play well at, at the same time, that's really going to be miraculous, you know, in every sense of the word, you know. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I told Gwil, you know, and, and, you know, even back then we were, we were a couple of cynical, you know, salty fellows, you know, kind of like, right, you know, okay. I mean, it, you know, as you know, it doesn't take long living, living in this, in this uh, particular metropolis to uh, bring on that sort of attitude. And uh, uh, so we were just kind of, ah, right, okay, we'll believe it when it happens. I'll believe it when I hear it. You know. Our mutual friend, uh, Jim Harrington, had been hired to take still photos of the recording session. At two in the morning, you know, Gwil gets a phone call from Jim, and he's at Levon's barn, you know. And he goes, holy shit, you know. I, I just asked the, I just asked somebody whose song this was that I've been listening to all day, you know. And he, that's how we found out that Deuce and a Quarter had been recorded by Keith and Scotty and DJ and Levon and company. You know, and, and then to hear it was uh, such a surreal experience. I remember Dan came and got me. He took me out to meet Scotty, who lived out in, near Ashland City, I believe. And he was a sweet, sweet guy, you know, of course, you know, great. Uh, but on the way out there, heard the, the track, you know, rough mix of the track. And uh, it was very cool. The part of this that is the unofficial 
uh, lowdown. A couple of months later, uh, Dan gave me something that I'm not supposed to have, which is, which was uh, a cassette, a recording of everything that was happening at the time that Keith was recording his vocal. And it's really, it was hard, really hard to listen to because it's totally uncompressed. So you've got, you know, engineer on the talkback mic, you know, blah, 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 you know. And then Scotty Moore apparently is standing next to Keith in the, whatever the vocal booth is. And they've, let's say they've had a few. It, it appears, it seems that they have consumed some alcohol during this afternoon. And Scotty is, is coaching Keith on his vocal. And apparently the words, the lyrics are written in chalk. They're written on a chalkboard that is just out of Keith's range of vision. Sort of seeing it, but... <laughs> so, oh, man, it's, uh, it, you know, it's a pretty interesting... There's some lines that he gets wrong. They're like, hey, I like that better, you know? <laughs> and they, they fix them, you know? But the great thing was... it. it seemed like those guys were having a really good time. Um, so for selfish reasons, I'm, I'm quite proud of that. Has this uh, secret recording been released into the wild? Oh, no, no. I was, Dan threatened me with my life at the time. So I basically, I had the, I've had the cassette all these years. Only in the last, you know, uh, year, I think it was one of my pandemic projects, did I get the cassette off the shelf and all it said on it was deuce and a quarter. And, you know, set up my rig and record it onto a hard drive. It sat on a shelf in the back room back there for 20 some odd years. And it's not the most weatherproof situation going on back there, but it seems to have held up and it's, you know, it's fun. It is what it is. I think a cassette would probably have lasted longer than if that was a digital file. <laughs> on the show true, true, true. At the recording session, I believe, obviously, Keith, Levon, Scotty Moore. I don't know if DJ actually played on the track, quite honestly. Um, I think it might have been Stan Lynch. Uh, former Heartbreakers drummer. Um, it was Danko, Richard Bell. That's that's probably everybody I know of. I don't know who, I don't remember who engineered it. I seem to remember seeing in the video Marshall Crenshaw. Yes. But I don't, I haven't seen the video in quite a while, so I don't know if he played bass maybe on that in the video, but I'm not sure. That's right. That's right. I do remember his name being mentioned as having been there. The whole deuce and a quarter thing does come up in, in conversation with, with people at shows sometimes. Will and I thought suddenly that we were going to be up a level in the, in the songwriting game, you know, in the Nashville songwriting game. You know, never mind that, you know, most publishers on Music Row, you know, didn't know who the who Keith Richards was 20 years ago, you know. Um, sorry, sorry, folks. Um, maybe that's a little harsh, but... Um, Facts are stubborn things. <laughs> <laughs> but, and also, you know, going back to Louisiana and playing after that happened. A friend of mine who was in one of my very first bands was an absolute Keith freak. So to him, man, it was like I had I had hit the big time, baby. You don't have to you can die now. But you know, then you start to I mean, I'm such a realist about this crap because you have to be to stay sane, relatively sane. And then you start explaining like, well, you know, it came out with all good intentions on this indie label. 
that unfortunately, you know, went belly up not too long after the record came out. So uh, it was a really weird experience. Like everyone's perceptions of what they thought had happened or what was going to happen versus what did happen, which let's say it allowed me to keep every bit of my humility, (laughs) which is a good thing. Thank you, Jesus. You know, uh, If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more like it, subscribe to my channel, click the like button, and tell me down below about the first time you heard Deuce and a Quarter, and I'll see you somewhere down the road. Much love to you.